Okay, great. So uh, the answer to how many bread slices you need to barely manage to get to school, I don't actually remember uh, the exact number, but a year later I got a telephone call from a girl who asked me the question, like, oh hi, I heard you calculated this uh, and started a conversation. It was one of the weirdest conversations I've ever had because I don't know why she was calling me or why she wanted to know this fact or how she knew it. Basically, it turns out that she was interested in me and she was you know, trying to get to know me. I had no idea until she came over and kissed me a week later. Then I finally made the connection. <laughs> so I'm a bit of a classic astronomer in that regard. So, yeah, my name is Paul Wilson. I'm an astronomer at the University of Warwick, and today I'm going to talk to you about comets, starting off with the early observations. So, back in ancient times, the astronomers back then had very little to work with, a very few tools, and comets were some of the most mysterious objects out there on the sky. Uh, they behaved nothing like the planets or the moon. They were very unpredictable. If you were lucky, they'd see maybe one or two comets in their lifetime, and then it was gone. Right, so... I, my title is about comets and the 5,000 years of observations, but what we've got to remember is that uh, people have been observing comets for as long as people have existed. And we see signs of this in ancient petroglyphs here, where they actually carved comets into stone. Take a look at the one on the right here. I do like this one in particular because it reminds me a little bit of Comet Magnaut, which we see here in the lower uh, image, where you see the tail of the comet here being spread out across the sky. The first people to actually make systematic observations of comets were the Chaldeans, which is now in modern-day Iraq, where Babylon was their capital. And they would actually record on stone tablets the observations that they did. And here is one of them uh, describing the passage of Halley's Comet in 164 BC. The Chinese astronomers also did a comet observations. Uh, here is a silk print from the second century BC where they show different comets uh, with all these different sort of tails. Now, the question is, what is a comet? And back in the day, it was not obvious that this was a celestial phenomena. Actually, for 2,000 years, uh, it started with Aristotle and uh, lasted until the Renaissance. People thought that comets were atmospheric phenomena. And here's an image from a very popular uh, 16th century textbook where they describe these special weather events. And you will notice that the galaxy or the Milky Way is featured in it. And you also have the comets, rainbows and other mysterious objects lumped into this one page. Comets were also considered to be bad omens. And here is a beautiful example of this from the Bayeux Tapestry, which depicts the Battle of Hastings in 1066. You can see here that King Harold is being informed by one of his soldiers that there's a comet up here in the sky, and this is seen as a bad omen for King Harold. However, for William the Conqueror, uh, who is coming in with the ships here to invade uh, England, this is a good omen. So I guess it depends on how you view it. Now, progress was made on the cometary front in the Renaissance, and uh, one hint that comets, comets weren't meteorological phenomena was when they, uh, these Italian and German astronomers noted that the cometary tail always pointed away from the sun. So this was a sign that this is perhaps not cometary uh, phenomena. It was actually not before uh, Tycho Brahe came along, and he uh, was a Danish astronomer, and he was one of the last great astronomers to do observations before the invention of the telescope. What he was keen on doing was actually measuring the distance to the comet using a technique called parallax. Now, what I'd like to do is do a demonstration of that technique. And uh, what I'd like you all to do is put one hand in front of you with the thumb up, right? Um, and then try and obscure my face looking through only one eye, yeah? I'm also, <laughs> I'm also in need of some promotional material. I thought I'd two birds with one stone. 
No, but seriously, let's go back to that experiment. Try and obscure my face looking at me with one eye. You should not be able to see me. Now, don't move your arm, but change looking through the other eye. And then back again, back forwards, back forwards. Do you notice how your thumb is moving backwards and forwards when you change eyes? Make note of how much it's moving, right? Then bring your thumb closer and do the same experiment. Do you notice how your thumb is moving further relative to the background compared to when it's out there, right? Now, imagine that the comet is your thumb, that this background here is the stars, and your eyes are two different positions uh, in Europe. And that's what happened. Galileo got one of his friends to stand in some other country. They decided on the time in which they wanted to conduct the observations, and they noted how much did the comets shift relative to the stars. And from that, they could actually calculate how far away the comet was. And they estimated that it was at least four times the distance between the Earth and the Moon. So now, without doubt, comets were a celestial phenomenon. Now, Newton came about and he uh, developed the theory of gravitation and Edmund Halley who had supported him in writing this uh, great work which was published in Principia Mathematica he actually calculated uh, when the next comet would arrive unfortunately um, he was not there to see the uh, results of his calculations come true, but the comet did actually arrive. And since he was able to predict the comet's appearance, Halley's Comet is named after him. So now that people could actually make predictions, people would walk out in the street every time a comet was expected and they would look up. Here's an image of people in Paris waiting for the comet of 1857. If I had been back then in the 18th, uh, I guess that would be 17th, 19th century, I, I get confused, 18 something or other, uh, this would probably be the situation. I'd be too obsessed with the equipment, getting the focus right, whilst the comet might be passing in the sky. You can't see it too clearly, but it's up here <laughs> being pointed at. Now, uh, people feared comets for quite a lot of time. A lot of superstition was associated with comets. And I can't say I blame them because magazines would print images like this, which is a brutal image of this comet coming in looking super guilty for just ripping the Earth apart. And yeah, it is a bit scary. But the most scary feature about it is that this is a print from 1857. And this moon looks like Donald Trump. It's uncanny. <laughs> There was also cometary hysteria in uh, the 1900s. Here's a brilliant example of this, where they were worried that the gas coming off the comet would actually poison people on Earth, the cyanogen gas. Here's an extract from the uh, New York Times, where uh, this professor of astronomy uh, sheds a little bit of panic by saying that uh, he thinks he would actually impregnate the atmosphere and possibly snuff out all life on the planet. But you know, don't worry. <laughs> um, in New York Times defense, they actually wrote an article earlier saying that actually it is too little gas to do any harm and what we should be focusing on is the eighth satellite of Jupiter. So get your priorities straight. <laughs> they were actually correct. This is what uh, happened. It was, uh, had no effect on people really. But that didn't stop con men. And there were people out there selling anti-comet tablets or pills, leather inhalers, and also these umbrellas that would somehow protect you from comets. And yeah, people bought them, so I don't know what they were thinking, but you know, this is a while ago. With the advent of photography coming about in the mid-19th century, for the first time, comets could be photographed. So this is the first image of a comet, and it's done um, by a photographer called William Usherwood. You might think, oh, he must be some uh, famous astronomer. He's actually not. He is a, a wedding and baby photographer who at the time happened to have a camera. And this really annoyed the professional astronomical community with their big telescopes that he managed to take these sort of images. Fast forward and let's talk a little bit about comets today. So comets are the time capsules of our solar system. And what I mean by that is that they formed very far out and they didn't actually go into forming the planets or the sun. 
So they are so the relics of our solar system. You might ask, well, aren't there rocks on Earth that are this old? And the answer is no, because Earth is very active. We don't see it, but on geological timescales, it is. You have the drift of the tectonic plates, you have volcanism, etc., which is currently recycling the material which is on Earth. And that is why we are so interested in looking at comets, because it tells us about what everything was formed from in our solar system. The comets themselves are mainly formed of water ice, and they are quite brittle, and they have a very low density. Here is a picture of Fred Whipple, who decided to bring a 500-pound snowball into a classroom to demonstrate how they can remind us a little bit about dirty snowballs. What I find fascinating is, wouldn't maybe a five-pound snowball do? Did he have to bring in 500 pounds of it? How long did he even speak about this sort of thing? He could say, that's what a comet nucleus looks like. All right, back to class. <laughs> and that thing is just dripping away. Poor janitor that comes to clean that up at the end of the day. You may remember the tablet I showed with the early observations of Halley's Comet, and you may remember the Bayou Tapestry with the comet up in the air. In 1986, we managed to actually photograph a comet for the first time, and this is Halley's Comet and the nucleus. So it's kind of interesting to know that this has been observed for millennia, and now for the first time, we can actually see what it looks like. There have been about 10 or so cometary missions. Um, this one I found particularly interesting. This was the Stardust mission where the satellite or the, the probe is actually following behind the comet and it has a metal plate on it covered with gel. Particles from the comet are actually impacting the gel at great speed. You can see it here coming into the gel. That was then put into... Whoa, I don't know what happened there. Oh, sorry, yeah. Just screensaver, no worries. <laughs> Oh, uh, maybe worries. All right, one moment. All right. All right, back to the talk. Uh, they put this, uh, this sample that they had collected into a capsule that was sent back down to Earth, and then they analyzed it, and one of the interesting results was they actually detected glycine, which is an amino acid. The Rosetta mission, uh, I can't have a comet talk without discussing it. It was a fantastic mission that got really close to a comet and provided some really interesting uh, images of it and did lots of important science. Here you can see details such as individual boulders, cliff faces, etc. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, as a part of this mission, they had a small lander which they tried to land on the comet, and it did land on the comet successfully. Unfortunately, the ground in which it was supposed to land on was a a bit too hard, so it bounced and landed somewhere else. This took a long time, uh, at least 40 or so minutes, and this is because the gravity is so low on a comet. So it bounced along and actually, unfortunately, ended up in this shadowy region, and it got all its power from solar panels. They didn't get any light, so the mission was cut short. Okay, so comets are very important to us because they con contain a lot of organic material and uh, they also contain a lot of water. And this water together with the water found in asteroids may have actually uh, brought the water that we have here on Earth. Uh, they contain uh, organic compounds so, such as amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein. And although it is unlikely that life may have actually uh, hitched a ride on a comet, it is quite likely that they may have actually brought some of the building blocks necessary for life to get started. Right at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about exocomets. These are comets that orbit other stars on the sky. And right now, we are able to detect and characterize these uh, comets. Here is uh, an example of a very recent uh, result. 
Yeah, I see the smile. The author's right there at the back. Um, <laughs> basically, what, is, what we're seeing here is the flux variation as a function of time. So as the nucleus, or the front part of the comet, comes in, we see a quick decrease in the amount of light, or flux. And then as the tenuous tail goes in front of the star, we see this gradual increase once it gets brighter and brighter. Comets colliding with each other may provide uh, a lot of the gas and dust in which we see in these rings, these circumstellar rings, meaning rings around a star. Um, and so we're very interested in uh, studying these to find out what exocomets are made out of. Uh, right now, as was mentioned, we have a workshop trying to figure out um, what the composition of these exocomets are like. And we have a wide variety of different astronomers, uh, astrobiologists, people working on disks, people working on planets, etc., all coming together in the same room to try and figure out how can we best learn about the composition of comets elsewhere. And we want to find them so that we can put our own solar system in context, so we can say, is our solar system really really rare or not. Uh, one thing we're also interested in learning how they may impact planetary formation and potentially also life. When you think about it, let's say a little bit of life has actually emerged on a planet. A comet could come in and just annihilate it and kill it and sterilize the surface. But at the same time, that very or different comet could come and actually bring organic material. So it may have a profound impact on life throughout the universe. And I think that together we will be able to find the best ways of probing exocomets and thereby continuing this long uh, historic legacy of cometary observations from ancient times to modern day. Thank you very much.